person that was falling off a cliff and he was only holding on to a rope that someone gave him. And it's only thanks to that connection with the rope that he still has life. But the second he lets go of the rope, it's game over. Wherever you get your podcasts from or our own website, prismoftorah.com. This is The Prism of Torah with Rabbi Saf Aaron Prisman. Shalom to everyone. In this week's parsha, Parsha Svayigash, I want to share with you a concept I saw brought down in the Sivas Shalom, which I think is very exciting, unique, and practical to all of us. We know that in Sparsha we reach the climax of the episode when the brothers are with Yosef. Yosef is the king of Mitzrayim. And finally, Yosef decides to reveal himself to the brothers and tell them that he is Yosef, their brother. The question begs itself. Yosef is saying to them, he took, he got everyone to go away and then behind the closed door, only him and the brothers, he says, I am Yosef. Is my father still alive? And the question begs itself, he should ask, is our father still alive? Not is Avi still alive, but Avinu, plural. Question number two. Then he goes on to tell them, by the way, I am Yosef, your brother, that you sold me to Mitzrayim. Everyone knows they sold him and they eventually got to Mitzrayim. Why is he emphasizing that point? We all know that he was sold by the brothers. And last question. Later on, when the brothers eventually realize it's Yosef, their brother, they go back to get their father Yaakov Avinu. And they say to their father, Yosef is still alive. He's in charge of Mitzrayim. He's the king over there. Come with us. And at first glance, when he heard this, Yaakov didn't believe them. And only after they spoke more to him and they sh- they saw the special present that Yosef sent him, the carriages and stuff, only then he believed. The question is, how can he not believe? These are the Shifteika, his sons. Surely he should believe them. Also, it's something that's... That's very easy to figure out if it's true or not. Why didn't he believe them? To answer all these questions, we have to bring the behind the scenes Yesoid over here concept that Yaakov is trying also to convey to the brothers. And that is, what enabled Yosef to pass the so many tests he had in such turbulent time? Be it the Nisayon he had with Eshet Potiphar that she tried to seduce him, be it his time period in jail in the Beis HaSuim, be it during the time he literally could do anything he wanted. He had all Mitzrayim in the palm of his, of his hand. And that was over there the epitome of impurity, of Tuma. And still he stayed to be this righteous tzaddik. As we know, the second you say Yosef, he's one of the few that we always say Yosef at tzaddik. How did he manage to do this? Yosef is actually hinting the answer to this question to his brothers. When he said, Ani Yosef ha'od avichai, he's telling his brothers, sometimes when Nehe is at the beginning of the word, it's not a question, it's rather a statement, a proclamation. He's telling them, you should know, don't be scared of me. I'm not upset that you sold me. And you should know I'm still the spiritual person, modest person, because od Avi Chai, my father, i.e. the connection that I had with my fa- our father, but my father, i.e. my connection with our father. That's why he said it in the singular form. My father, Avi, my relationship with my father, my relationship with our father is still alive and kicking. And that is what gave me the strength to be able to be successful in all these tests, these nisyonis that Kodesh gave me. And that's why I'm able to limloch on Mitzrayim without letting the Tumah negatively affect me. And that's what he was telling them. Listen, Yes, the relationship I had with my father, which was unique and special, it's still alive and kicking. And that is what allowed me to persevere and to continue going in the ways of Hashem, despite the crazy environment I am living in right now. And despite that literally in Gashmias, he can do any taiva he wants. And where is another proof to this idea? Because we know the Gemara in Saita, Daflamet Vava Mudbeis, says that when he almost failed in the test he had with Eshet Potiphar, when she tried to persuade him and seduce him to be with him, with her, it says that suddenly the Gemara says he saw the image of his father. And it's from that strength from that connection he had with his father, he had the strength to do the Tzon Hashem and to not fall in the pitfall of the Yetzirah. This was also hinted to the brothers when he said, I am the same Yosef that you sold, that you sold. Yes, remember when you sold me? It was a long time ago. And eventually I ended up in Mitzrayim. I am the same Yosef. I didn't change. And that's why he re- 
reiterated the fact that everyone knew that they sold him because it's telling them and hinting to them, I am the same Yosef, the same as you knew me during the time period when you sold me. Why? Because I still have that Kesher with our father. And that is my special Kesher that gave me the strength to continue in life in the right path, no matter what Nisyonis was were facing me. It's like a, a person that was falling off a cliff and someone and he was only holding on to a rope that someone gave him or to something strong. And it's only thanks to that connection with that rope that he still has life. But the second he lets go of that rope, it's game over. The Gemara, the Midrash Rabbah. Yud Zayn Zayn says that what is it similar to? It's similar to a person that was thrown into a crazy sea with crazy waves. And then the head of the ship throws to him a lifesaver or, or a rope and he holds on to it. Kolod, he holds on to that life-saving rope. He's still Nechshav alive. He's connected. The second he lets go, it's game over. This is exactly the message Yosef was conveying to the brothers and the message for all of us. The importance of staying connected to Yiddishkeit, to to tzaddikim, to an, to an environment of a tzibur. There's koach tzibur also. When you're staying connected, it ensures you don't go beyond underneath the red line. With this, we can also answer our other question. How can it be that Yaakov didn't believe the other brothers when they told him, calm down with us to Mitzrayim. Y- Yosef, your son is still alive. Our brother's alive and is the king of Mitzrayim. How could he not believe? Answer, of course he believed he was the king of Mitzrayim. But they also told him and he's still a tzaddik. He's a good person. He stayed the same. That he couldn't believe. He said, how can it be the Tuma, the Koychus of Tuma, the, imp- the, the, the impurity in Mitzrayim was extreme. How can it be that through all these years he stayed as a tzaddik. And then they came to him, if you look in the psukim, it mamash screams this idea out, that after he didn't believe at first sight, he, they then come closer to him, and they said to him, et kol divrei Yosef asher diber elehem, which means, they said to him everything that Yosef told him. And we want to suggest what are those things? This idea that he said, I'm still connected to my father. They told him, he, they told their father Yaakov, Yosef felt he was always connected to you in his heart. And that is what kept him going. When he heard this and he saw the gift that Yosef sent to him, which is another hint to prove that he's still connected to Yaakov. Then he said, oh, now I believe that not only is he alive, which I believed you in the first place, but I now believe he's still a tzaddik despite the nisyonis and the fact and the, despite the fact he had Tuma all around him because he's still connected to me when you're still connected that is mamish a lifesaver and to take it a deep further another step further what did he give him as a present Bereshis Raba tells us the Midrash tells us the reason he sent him these carriages is to remind him the last thing they learned together in Torah and that is the Parsha of Egla Rufa which in short means that when a dead person is found between two cities, then we find out who is the closest city and there's a certain ceremony that has to be done. In that ceremony, without getting into the details, in that ceremony, the elderly people, the skenim of that city, say we're innocent, we didn't kill this person. Based on the Gemara, in Soita, Daf Mem Vavamud Beis over there, the Maral explains that pretty much what it means is we didn't let him leave our city without walking him out and giving him what he needs. Because if we did not walk him out, it's like killing a person. Why? Because there's no Kesha. When you're connected to people and they walk you out, there's a connection. That connection gives strength to the person that's now going out on his own and keeps him going even during difficult, turbulent times. And if you don't take care of a person, give him food for the way, walk him out, then you're showing you're not connected to him and it doesn't give him strength. And this is another thing that Yosef was trying to hint to Yaakov through this present. Not only is he hinting to him and showing to him, I still am holding on to the Torah we learned together, which is the strongest Kesher one can have. In brackets, I want to say, when it says, V'nafshok shura v'nafshok, in our Parsha, in a different context, says the son of the Rambam, Rabbi Avram ben Rambam, says Shura in Gematria numerical value is the same as Torah which means the best Kesher connection you can have with someone is through Torah and that he had and that's what kept him going but more than that there's something unique about this Parsha in the Torah because it screams out this idea of the importance of being connected to others hold on to be connected because that is your lifeline especially during turbulent time that connection to people to a tzibu to a tzaddik keeps you going and has a special shmir on you 
continue. Ad kedei kach, I want to suggest that that's one of the heli gemin hagim we have on Rosh Hashanah the first night. That it's very important. Everyone goes around to everyone and wishes them a shana toiva, a shana toiva tikasev zichasem lealta lechaim toivim v'leshalom. Because that also shows you're part of a tzibur and we're all connected. And that's the whole idea of koach a tzibur. And that and and that's also the danger of lifrosh min a tzibur. We know Chazal tell us how dangerous that is. What we just said is actually hinted, or even more than hinted, in the Bala Turim himself. When Yaakov last saw Yosef, before he ended up being in Mitzrayim, it says, Vayishlechehu me'emek chevroin. Says over the Bala Turim, he walked him till Chevroin when he left. And then, Yosef told his father, go back, go back. I don't need you to come with me. His father Yaakov said back to him, No. It says in the parsha we learn in Egla Rufa, Yadeinu lo shafchu et adam azeh. The skenim of that city, that dead body was found closest to them. They say, we didn't kill him. And we know the meaning of that. He so told his son, we didn't let him leave our city without walking him out. How can I not walk you out? That is what gives strength to a person. And that's exactly Balatun connects it to the present, to these carriages that have to do with Egla Rufa, this Parsha. It's a hint to that Parsha. From here, obviously, we learn the awesome importance that one has to stay connected. From one perspective, you have to always stay connected to a good environment, to a good Sibu. Because that is what ensures you'll stay focused about what life is all about and go in the ways of Hashem. But from a different perspective, you should do your utmost to keep others connected. Don't only think about yourself, but ensure you, you should ensure that people around you are connected to you or to the people they need to be connected to because you have no idea what the ripple effect of that will be. Even a small smile here and there to a person, to a bachor, to a young person, you have a no idea. That in itself can keep a person connected and can give us a special shmira during all the times, especially during difficult times. I would like to end with a story that my wife heard in one of the parent-teacher meetings. They had a communal one. And I think it has a lot to do with this idea that we're discussed. Once there was this uh, mother, she was at a certain workplace for several years and she already had a name that she knows how to bake, cake, bake cakes in an unbelievable professional way even though she wasn't a professional in baking cakes. Everyone heard about it but she never got an opportunity to do anything. Finally there was some special get together of all the company and they asked her to make one of her famous cakes. So she worked really hard on it. She made this really unique four layers type of cake she put in the fridge. At the same time, her son asked her, please, we're having a seal in Cheder. I really want to bring a cake. Everyone heard about your cakes. Can you please make me one cake? So she makes a cake, but of course this one, she doesn't make a real professional one. She made it with chocolates and sprinkles and the regular standard cake, but a nice one. When she wakes up in the morning, she goes to the fridge and she sees black in her eyes. She can't believe what she's seeing. She only sees the child cake, the cake with chocolates and some sprinkles. She quickly realized what has, ha what has happened. Her son thought the huge cake was for him, so he took it. She said, this is a mistake. I must call him. So she's about to call him or call the cheder and say, call him. He had a cell phone and tell him, please, you made a mistake. Let's switch the cakes. But then she stopped herself and said, wait a second over here. <laughs> How bad is he going to look in front of his friends? Everyone on the school bus can already see, wow, look at that. You made that for the seal? That's unbelievable. That's a Your mom made that? And suddenly he's going to look like the biggest loser because they're going to have to pull a switch and he's going to come with this 10 to the size cake instead. So she decides, I'm not doing this to him. I'm not doing this to him. So she maybe didn't have the most pleasant time at work. I don't even know what she, do. she did because that part of the story was never told to me. If she made another cake or she just went with that small cake. But the story continues. Later on, as this kid became older, unfortunately, he went a bit off from the the standard derech and he became more less religious we'll call it and the one thing that kept him going is for some reason the yamikai didn't take off it got to a point to such an extreme point that him and his friends said that's it let's just go away for a while out of the country they lived in israel they were about to go somewhere to chutzlarts and who knows what would have happened there and as they're waiting in line just before they're going to board to the plane there's a section in the airport over here that you go to some cafeteria they were going to buy a cake or something and coffee as they're waiting in line he suddenly sees a cake. It looked exactly like that cake that he took to the seum seven years before. And suddenly it hit him. Wow, look how much my mother invested in me. She even made such a cake for my seum, for my Yiddishkeit. How can I do this? How can I just leave? How can I do such a thing? And on instantly he decided, that's it. I'm not going. I'm not going. He told his friends, I'm sorry, I can't do it and turn back home. And that was such a turning point in his life. And since then, he built himself up and eventually got married to a very firm girl. And that was almost the end of the story. But there's one other piece to the story. And that is, he got married and the night after the, the night of the wedding, 
After the wedding, he leaves the long load to his parents, more for his mother, and he wrote to her, you don't even know the true story. The whole story is that it got to a point where I was so far from Yiddishkeit. The only thing I had to do was take my yarmulke off, it was all for show. And I planned to go to America and take off my yarmulke there where no one knows me, I won't feel bad taking off my yarmulke and I'll totally be disconnected. But it's the cake you made me that kept me connected. It is that cake that made me realize, wow, I'm connected to something big here. I have to make a change. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for that connection, for everything you did for me. As the mother says this story to the parents, she says, I want to tell you something. He doesn't even know the true story. The true story is I didn't even plan on giving him that cake. I planned on giving him a small cake, a dinky cake. At the end of the day, we learned from this story, um, from the votes that were saying what Yosef told the brothers, the extreme importance of staying connected. Staying connected is staying alive. This is true about everyone, especially the relationship of someone that is actually close to you, like your kids. To do what Yosef was able to do, stay connected and ensure that others will be connected to us, to ensure we all live a life of Torah and mitzvahs, a life of achdus, and through that will be merit, will merit to be as a Mashiach and have shalom for all of Klal Yisrael. Amen v'amen. This concludes another episode of the Prism of Terror. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed it and learned something valuable. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast and give a five-star rating. You can also find this podcast wherever you get your podcasts or our own website, prismofterror.com, where we have a full archive of all our past episodes. We would like to thank Yona Vefa for the recording equipment and Ellie Podcast Productions for handling all our post-podcast productions. Join us next week for another enlightening conversation on the Prism of Terror.